Good morning, everybody. How you doing, church? Man, it is so good to be here. It just feels like a home away from home. Uh, Andy and I, my wife and I, we love your pastors. Anybody else around here love your pastors, Josh and Kristen? And what an awesome family. What an amazing thing God is doing here. Man, and since I was here last, like look around, like the building, it's just, it's amazing. It's a miracle and you get to be part of it. Isn't that amazing? I, um, I send love from Andy. In fact, I think we got a photo of Andy and the kids. There she is. She is, as we speak, flying from San Diego home. She was preaching this weekend too. And uh, she sends her love, wishes she could be here. Um, but that was one of our last photos taken in New York City before we moved. Uh, small change to Charleston, South Carolina. That's a change. And... Uh, of course, I'm originally from the South. You can tell from my accent. Uh, the deep South, which is Australia. And now I'm experiencing the other South and I'm learning to say things like y'all. I have a lot of, I, have to, I haven't at all tried how to say Charleston properly yet, but people are teaching me. I appreciate that. Um, but we've stepped out in faith. It's been amazing. It's totally a God thing transitioned uh, the lead pastoring of our church to great friends of ours who are gonna do an incredible job. We're playing a founder's role. And now, I get to just love on pastors and leaders, pour back into people who spend their lives pouring into everybody else and see them finish the race that God has called them to. I'm super excited about it. I'm grateful to God for you guys as a church partnering with us in that. And I believe the eternal fruit is gonna be significant. Um, I'm so thrilled to be here and, and I wanna get right to it. I got, I got a message and I think it's timely. And I wanna give a big disclaimer. I'm preaching this message as somebody who is a work in progress. Is that all right? This particular message is not one of these, now that I've mastered this, I'm gonna teach you all about it. No, because the subject this morning is how to avoid offence. That's the title for our message this morning, how to avoid offence. Um, my wife, Andy, re recently released her third book and it's called Friendship, It's Complicated. <laughs> Can I get an amen? And uh, she's getting feedback from women really all over the world saying how helpful it has been when we can have so many unhealthy, complicated relationships. Well, I guess it struck a chord because she actually, believe it or not, got to be on the Today Show like a week ago uh, talking about it. And we got, we got to laughing because we're like, we could do a whole series. Because let's face it, marriage, also complicated. Anyone? Don't, you don't have to amen too loud. It's like a, you know, if you're sitting with your partner, you can just nod. Uh, you know, parenting, also complicated. Like relationships, right, can be complicated. Even the kingdom, they can be complicated. I don't know if it's just New Yorkers. Uh, they are a little crazy up there. But honestly, I feel like getting offended is a lot of people's side hustle. Like that is like a part-time gig for them. It's just being offended about something or ideally everything. Um, and they'll get offended. And before you know it, they've quit friendship. They've quit their marriage. They've quit their church. You find out on Instagram. Uh, so we actually did a series in our church like about a month or so ago called No Offense. <laughs> a whole series on how to deal with offence, avoid offence. Well, it, to me, that kind of title made me laugh a little bit because I thought of all the times somebody has said to me in a conversation, no offence. Usually they say no offence, but, and what comes out of their mouth next is offensive, right? It's like as if to say, you know, if you say no offence, but I hate your guts, that's supposed to mean like, don't take any offence. It's supposed to diffuse the whole situation. It's like when somebody says to you, you know, with all due respect, <laughs> has anybody ever felt respected by what was said next, right? It basically assumes, apparently you assume I'm not due any respect at all by what comes out of your mouth next. See, I find relationships can be complex. Communication being one of the most important things in our relationships. And we live in a day when I think there's so much bickering, so much strife, so much polarising, so many divisions in our world, cancelling and people being offended and attacking each other, it could seem almost, keyword, almost impossible to disagree and do it in a Christ-honouring way. It could seem almost impossible to unite in spite of our differences. It could seem you couldn't maintain love and honour in a world like this, but you can. And Jesus taught us a better way, amen? 
So I wanna talk about how to avoid offence this morning. We're gonna start with Proverbs 19, verse 11. And we're gonna get real practical in church. Proverbs 19, 11 says, a person's wisdom yields patience. Oh, I already feel convicted. Anyone else working on patience? I am, the Lord's teaching me patience on the roads of Charleston right now, everybody. So don't honk, Paul. Patience, Lord, patience, Lord. A person's wisdom yields patience and listen, it is to one's glory to overlook an offence. Ooh, that's a good thought right there. It is to one's glory to what? Overlook an offence. What if we didn't always have to fight? What if, what if we didn't have to respond to every social media post that irritated us? <laughs> now, just to get ahead of myself a little bit, this is not gonna be a message about Conflict resolution, that's super important. The Bible has a lot to say about it. Great message for another day. This is actually a step before that. Inevitably, you're gonna have to know how to stand on the Word of God and work out a conflict when, it's, when it comes up. But what if we took one step back? This is a message just about having less conflict in the first place. Wouldn't that be good? What if we focused on prevention being even better than the cure? Have you ever heard it said that we should Build a fence, a fence, not offense, a fence at the top of the cliff instead of always sending an ambulance to the bottom. And we find ourselves in these cycles of drama and reaction and counter reaction. Maybe it's time for a few fences in our life, a few healthy boundaries. What, what if we did what the Bible said, which is to guard our hearts with all diligence because out of it flow all the issues of life. See, the thing is life happens and people are imperfect. I mean, I don't mean you, but everyone else, right? People are in, we are imperfect. We're gonna make mistakes, say the wrong thing or not say the right thing, right? We're gonna offend people with what we do or say or don't do or don't say. Opportunities to be offended will come. But I believe a wise person lives by principles and practices that enable them to be saved from many offences. Listen, 30 years of following Jesus 12 years of planting and pastoring churches in New York City. Believe it or not, I've had opportunities to be offended. It's crazy, right? Believe it or not, New Yorkers can be rude to you. I know that seems, that's gonna come as a total shock. Believe it or not, sometimes people are even mean to pastors, you guys. I know that wouldn't happen here in sunny, beautiful Florida, but in New York, it gets crazy up there. No, the truth is, I had so many opportunities to be disappointed, hurt, frustrated, downright offended. And you know, honestly, leading through the last few years as lead pastor through a pandemic, there were times when based on how people would treat us publicly and privately, you would have thought I personally started the pandemic. Like it was my idea, you know what I mean? And so no wonder people are so mad at every single decision I make, no matter what I do, a whole group of people gets angry and leaves. Basically how it, how it felt, right? Leading through the pandemic. And I'm like, man, I'm just like you, trying to figure this out, trying to follow Jesus, trying to extend the gospel and the kingdom. So let's talk about six ways to avoid offence. Does this sound like it might be a good message for anyone? I'm just sharing what I'm learning, folks. I'm gonna share with you what I've been doing to live a life less offended. Number one, remember to keep short accounts. This has become kind of like a repeating phrase in our home on our staff, keep short accounts. In other words, don't let things get too long before you address them. Don't let things pile up until a molehill has become a mountain. Don't let things get away from you. Keep short accounts. Hebrews 12, 15 says this, look after each other so that none of you fails to receive the grace of God. Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. Just keep that up for a minute. First, the Bible starts with a pretty heavy duty warning of what happens when we don't deal with offence and bitterness and we allow it to grow up. The fruit of it can be that people could fail to receive the grace of God. That's a big deal. It can literally drive people from grace, from community even, if offence becomes a wedge. How does it happen? Four-step process the Bible gives us. Watch out, the first thing is the poisonous root. 
Watch out that no poisonous root, right? The root is little. Think about what a root is. It's small and actually it's kind of under the surface. You don't even see roots. That's the whole thing, it's under there. That's what a fence does. It starts under the surface, little. Just kind of seems innocuous, no big deal. I'll just let it go. It is a poisonous root though. Important note. So what's gonna grow from it? Something not good. It says a poisonous root of bitterness grows up. That's the second step. We let it grow. If we don't dig it out right there, it grows. And what happens when we let it grow? Then it grows up and it troubles you. That's the third step. Grows up to trouble you, but sure enough, it's not gonna end with you, is it? It's gonna spill over and it says, to trouble you, corrupting many. I think it's the New King James that says, uh, it says defiling many. Have you ever been in a conversation where somebody's so offended that you almost feel defiled, dirty, icky, being in the conversation at the end. It didn't start that way. It started as a little root. Let me give you a personal example of this. One I'm not proud of, but it might be helpful. So we planted this church in New York City 12 years ago. And you know, as we go, you start to get to know other pastors in the city and you go to different events and you hear people speaking. Well, there was one particular guy I had a lot of respect for. Amazing leader, he born and raised in the city, pastored an incredible, still leads an incredible church in the Bronx and a man of God. But something would bother me when he was speaking. He'd give these stories and he would talk about pastors who come to the city, you know, parachute in and plant their churches. And, he, and, and this thought took root. I was listening to him speak one time and, and this thought popped into my head. He's talking about me. I really believed it. I was like, he's talking about me. And so I started to listen through that filter. He's talking about me. And I started to get mad about it. It's like, what's his problem? I, I'm the one that moved all the way around the world and you know, trying to, trying to reach people like you are. Why are you mad at me? So, well, the problem is now I'm mad at him. And uh, so another time I'm going to hear him speak again and I've heard him speak twice before. And he had that same thing to me. Oh, he's gonna rant. And so, so I, just, I literally said to myself, this is terrible church, don't do this. Um, Learn from my mistakes. I literally said to myself, I was like, if he talks about that thing again, I'm gonna leave. So I was, you know, with our staff at this conference, kind of sitting near the back. Sure enough, he starts talking about it. And so I left. Nobody saw me leave. I just sort of snuck out. And I was halfway to Starbucks when the Holy Spirit just said to me, what are you doing? And you know, you can't really, you can't lie to the Holy Spirit, you guys, just a little side note. Uh, so I, was, I couldn't just pull that, oh, I'm just getting a coffee, you know. Uh, well, I was like, and I just sort of like blurted out this whole, well, I've heard this message before. And I, was, I was just mad, I'm processing. And, and the Holy Spirit, I felt the Holy Spirit say, are you gonna talk to Him about that? So I'm like, all right, well, I still got my coffee, but I went back and I sat in the back and the whole time I'm sitting there, I was like, I need to have this conversation. I don't wanna have this conversation, but I did. So I, I made an appointment and I went to sit in his office. I'd never been to his office before. And so this is, this is so funny, you guys. I'm gonna have this conversation. I gotta ask him why he's so mad at me. But the whole time, he's like, I love your church. You guys are such an example. I'm like, oh man, this isn't lining up with what I was thinking at all. And you know, he's like raving on and on about having us in the city. Then he says, I've gotta go. And I said, no, 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 I, I had a question to ask you. He says, sure, what is it? And I said, have I offended you? And he's, he looked like this, he's like, what? And I said, well, he goes, what do you mean? I said, have I done something to offend you? I have not honoured you? You know, I would, I would wanna own that and apologise for that. He says, why would you think that? And I said, well, I heard you speak a few times and then, you, and then the embarrassment started to settle in as I heard myself say these words out loud. I thought you were talking about me. Anyone be there? Well, you just, because of course, Every conversation is about us, right? I mean, everyone's thinking about me all the time since I'm the center of the universe. So I say this to him and he literally laughed. He's like, that's not what I was talking about at all. And then he explains what he really meant. And he goes, I really do have to go, but let me just say one more thing. He pushes back his chair from his desk and he says, that was kind of gangster. <laughs> and I said, I, said, what? I said, what do you mean? He goes, he goes, you come up here in my office and sit across from me at my desk and ask me if I'm offended with you. He goes, I respect that. He goes, he sh we should be friends. <laughs> and so we became friends, you guys. The craziest thing, it just diffused the whole situation. In fact, when we decided that we were stepping out in faith into this new season, like he was one of my first phone calls to somebody in the city. I wanted to hear it straight from me, but it could have gone a whole different way, right? If I didn't dig out that root. This is what 2 Corinthians 10, 5 says. 
It says, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself against the knowledge of God. Listen, how do we do that? And we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. Every thought. You know, if you let your thoughts go, they become beliefs and arguments. And before you know it, you've got a stronghold. We take captive every thought. You gotta nip those things in the bud. Keep short accounts. One of the saddest parts of pastoring for me over the years was to sit across from somebody who would explain that they were hurt or offended or oftentimes that they were leaving our church and they wanted me to know why. I had no problem with people leaving. That's, that happens, that's part of life. But I would be so grieved sometimes to find out they had a list going back years of things. You didn't, I didn't get invited to this and I thought this. And when you said that, I thought you meant this. And I was like, oh man, why didn't we have this conversation sooner? And I've been guilty of that too. But it would break my heart to think, man, we could've, I could have explained what I meant and apologized for hurting you anyway. Or I could have just owned it. Man, I blew it. Please forgive me. Let's walk this out together instead. By the time we have the conversation, the damage is done. They're hitting the road. You know, the, the problem with being offended is that you're always gathering evidence, Right? And I've noticed, I don't know if this is just me, my offence doesn't distinguish between fact and fiction. Offence is just looking for backup. Anything that kinda, sorta, looks or smells a little bit like that could be, yep, validated. I'm just gonna put that on my little pile over here. We're not gonna have the conversation, but man, I, now it's in bold, it's underlined, it's all caps, I am right, yeah? Keep short accounts. Number two, Woo, this one's a big one. We can spend the whole message here, remember, to talk to people, not about them. Oof. Talk to people, not about them. Matthew 18, great chapter. It says this in verse 15, it says, if another believer sins against you, go privately and point out the offence. And if, keyword, if the other person listens and confesses it, you have won that person back. Now, the chapter goes on to say what happens if they don't. Now, like I say, this is not about conflict resolution today, but Matthew 18 is a great chapter, if you're in one, to walk out what's the next step, and then the next step, and then the next step. But I wanna just focus on the first step. The very first thing is go privately. It doesn't say go public. <laughs> it says go privately. It doesn't say talk to other people about them and then use Christian language like I'm just processing with you. It doesn't say troll them on social media or figure out ways to shame them. No, the first steps of a Jesus follower are done in private. You go to them and you have the conversation. Are we beginning where the Bible commands us to, teaches us to? I mean, if you flip it around the other way, isn't the opposite, isn't talking about people and not to them a pretty good working definition of gossip, right? And then in our day and age, we have social media, which I reference because it can amplify all of that. Actually, in many ways, not just gossip, but now it's slander because it happens in the public square and brings shame, doesn't it? Doesn't it bring shame not just on the other person, but often brings disrepute even on the church, on the body of Christ? Because wait a minute, sidebar, what does Jesus say is gonna be how people know we're His Followers, it's, I mean, I, I'm all about going to church, reading my Bible, praying and worship, but it's none of those things that Jesus chooses as the qualification in the eyes of the world. He says, by this will all men know you are my disciples if you love one another. So it's relational, isn't it? It's the way that we love, especially those that we disagree with or that we're in conflict with, especially in that the world sees Jesus or the opposite, the absence of that. Romans 12, 18, says, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. I'm really glad that the Bible doesn't just have that last part, live at peace with everyone, because that's impossible, right? The Bible gives you a couple of really important caveats, but it puts the responsibility still on you. It says, if it is possible, i.e. it is not always possible, because every relationship is a two-way street, right? If it is possible, listen, here's the key, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. So this is where our responsibility lies. Instead of all the finger pointing and looking to assign blame, it's to say, what is it that is 
up to me. As far as it depends on me, what depends on me here? Well, one of the things is go to them. Have the conversation, go to them. And in that way, we might just have a chance to live at peace with others. The fact is, if we don't, and if, we, if the other person hears or even just senses that you're talking to everyone else but them, don't you think that offence hardens even more and the likelihood of reconciliation gets smaller and smaller, the more we don't just do the work and have the conversation. Number three is remember the Imago Day in everyone. Getting a little Latin here this morning, getting nerdy. Imago Day means image of God. It comes from Genesis 1, 26, the creation story, famous passage. It says, then God said, let us make mankind in our image. In the Imago Day, the image of God. Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so they may rule over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over the creatures that move along the ground. See, this third key to avoiding offence in your life is to remind your soul, that person that you're frustrated with, that person who triggered you, that person who, whatever, pressed your buttons this morning, just like you, <coughs> is made in the image of God. This is wild, created by God. By the way, the image of God in every human being is one of the reasons why racism is such a travesty. To attempt to in any way deny the greatness, the majesty, the beauty and the wonder of God in someone that looks different than you. No, it shouldn't be so, not in the kingdom. The image of God, His Imago Dei, is in every person. Which is why I love this quote from John Calvin who many years ago said this, he said, we should not regard what a man is and what he deserves, but we should go higher. That it is God who has placed us in the world for such a purpose that we be united and joined together. He has impressed His image in us, given us a common nature, which should incite us to providing one for the other. The man who wishes to exempt himself from providing for his neighbours should face himself and declare he no longer wishes to be a man. For as long as we are human creatures, we must contemplate as in a mirror our face in those who are poor, despised, exhausted and grown under their burdens. So here's how this works in practice. When you find yourself getting mad at someone and it happens, what if you were to remind yourself God created them more. God loves them. Even if they don't love Him back, God loves them. And even more than that, Jesus counted them worthy of His life, His body, and His blood. Oftentimes when I'm in a conflict situation, I tend to elevate myself and wanna pull down others. I need to lift them back up to the place that every human being, regardless of their choices and behaviours, deserves created in the very image of God. And let's face it, sometimes especially the people that irritate us are being used by God <laughs> to shape us into the likeness of Jesus, which let's face it, is mostly not a very pleasant process. Number four, remember we are connected. Remember we're connected. The Bible many times talks about the church, the, the capital C church, the bride, as it describes us as a body, one body. It says in 1 Corinthians 12, for instance, verse 26, if one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. And if one part is honoured, all the parts are glad. All of you together are Christ's body and each of you is a part of it. One of the surest ways to have less offence, less conflict and division in our lives is just to be reminded that we're all still part of one body. And by definition, the body is made up of parts that are different, look different, perform different functions, but, but are designed to need each other. And when one part suffers, the whole suffers. When one part is honoured, the Bible says, all of it is glad. With the, with the body of Christ. But when we allow offence to get in, that root takes root, it begins to grow and fester. Now we tear apart the body of Christ. Division comes. 
And now let's face it, not only those directly involved are experiencing the pain, the tearing of that, but oftentimes, one of the things we don't count the cost of is that the world is watching on, right? Now suddenly the reputation, not only of the church, but by extension, Jesus, His Gospel, His good news is being called into question because people are not seeing the likeness of Jesus in us. And I don't say this with judgment. I certainly don't say it as somebody standing up here as if I've got this all down, but we've got to realise the body of Christ pays a price when we allow that kind of division. You know, when I first got saved, the church I came to faith in, and in those days, you know, it was commonplace in a message to make fun of other churches and denominations. And if the people weren't responding, you know, the preacher would make a sideways joke that they're like some such and such a denomination with how they're responding today. I look back now and I'm mortified to think, why do we think that was funny? Why do we think that was okay? I'm pretty sure I'm gonna look back on the times we're living in now, years from now, and wonder the same thing. Why did we allow such division? Why did we allow that within the body of Christ? See, I believe if we remember that connection, frankly, church, if we would foster that connection, what if we intentionally did more life with people who aren't exactly like us, who don't look and think and believe and speak exactly the same as us? I think we would discover in that place, not only the Imago Dei, the image of God, but we would find the common ground. John Wesley, speaking about the divide between the rich and the poor, he said one reason why the rich in general have so little sympathy for the poor is because they so seldom visit them. He's talking about connection again, right? Hence, it is that one part of the world does not know what the other suffers. Many of them do not know because they do not care to know. They keep out of the way of knowing it and then they plead their voluntary ignorance as an excuse for their hardness of hearts. It's a challenge, isn't it? So church, if we wanna have less offence in our lives, maybe we could build some bridges, amen? instead of all the time putting up walls. Number five, remember logs and specks. Remember logs and specks. I'll explain what that means in a minute from Scripture, but I'll, I'll give you an illustration. Not so long ago, my kids were being too loud for my liking on the other floor of the house, and I yelled, stop yelling! And as I yelled, stop yelling, I just got to thinking of how ironic that was, which is a Christian way of saying hypocritical that was, that I yelled in order to stop them from yelling. That's basically a lot of what happens in our conflict and in our offence is we're in one way or another kind of yelling, stop yelling, because the problem is always out there, right? Jesus said it this way, Luke 6, 42. <laughs> well, this is, this is a lot. How can you think of saying, friend, <laughs> let me help you get rid of that speck in your eye when you can't see past the log in your own eye. There's the logs and the specks, right? Hypocrite! First get rid of the log in your own eye and then you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. This is so challenging, church. So just imagine I did in fact have a log in my eye I don't know if you're capable of this, I am. I got this glaring issue, this big heart thing going on. I'm all bent out of shape, but somehow out of my peripheral vision, I'm still able to spot a speck in somebody else's eye. And everybody around me is like, this is kind of weird because when I turn to address it, everybody, you know, have to, have to duck, right, to get under the log in my eye. I'm like, why are people always doing squats around me? Probably the log, I'm just saying, could be the log. I don't mean to be judgy, uh, but the log. So this is the problem. And the Bible isn't even saying there's no speck in their eye. It doesn't even say don't help them. But it's like, just first things first, deal with you, to paraphrase Jesus, right? Work on the log and then you might have 20-20 vision to work on that speck. But in the meantime, the hypocrisy is not lost on everybody else, the irony. See, a good question to ask is, what's my responsibility here? What's my responsibility? I'll give you an example. I have a hard time not defending myself when people speak badly about me. It's very human nature, but it's not the nature of Christ. I wanna defend myself and better, I wanna go on the counterattack. I wanna take it to DEFCON, I don't know, 90 and counterattack, you know. And I have to pause. And you know, King David was like, search my heart, O oh Lord, see if there's any wicked way in me, right? Ah. Now I have to do the inward work to say, okay, 
Lord, is there something that this reveals in me? Either what has been said, is there some truth, Lord, that You wanna show me? Or even if there's no truth to what they say, why am I reacting like this? Why can't I sleep? Why am I taking no prisoners? Like what is going on in Paul? That's interesting. Let's talk about that. Do you trust that God is your vindicator? Amen. That's the challenge for me. I need to search my own heart. Now, one important thing. I am not suggesting that you should be a doormat, that every crazy thing that gets said about you by anybody who doesn't even know you is okay. And you should just take it all on. Yes, I am just a worm. No, I'm not saying that. But if every little incursion in your life requires immediate and disproportionate response, let's do some work in here, amen. Last one, number six is remember your redemption. This might be the biggest key of all of them. I mean, I believe in all these steps and I wanna read them back to you in a moment so we can pray and reflect. But if all we did was to remember our redemption, in other words, that what Jesus did for us on the cross to pay the price for our sin, the debt we could never pay, that sure goes a long way to putting everything back in perspective that happens on this earth. I've always been so inspired by um, the woman who just shortly before Jesus is crucified, comes weeping at His feet, anoints His feet with oil. And, and she's, it's happening in the house of a Pharisee, like a religious leader who was judging her in his heart. And this is what Jesus said. Jesus said in Luke 7, 47, I tell you, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. So she has shown me much love. But a person who is forgiven little shows only little love. So Jesus doesn't gloss over her sin. He said, yeah, she sinned. In fact, she has many sins, but she's received that forgiveness, right? And so her love, her love is proportionate to her understanding of redemption, to say it another way. Is Jesus suggesting that the Pharisee didn't have much to forgive? No. I think what He's suggesting is if that Pharisee would open himself up to experience that incredible love, the price that Jesus paid, He would too would be overcome, overwhelmed, put His pride aside, do anything to in some way say it back. <laughs> what we sang this morning to Jesus for all that He's done. See, there's a connection between remembering your own forgiveness, your own need of a Saviour and being able to extend grace and love and forgiveness to others. And the longer we follow Jesus, the more important it is we hang on to that, to remember, I once was lost and now I'm found. Amen? I was blind, but now I see. To remember amazing grace. Matthew 18 puts it this way. Jesus tells this challenging story and I'll finish with this. He says, the Kingdom of Heaven can be compared to a king who decided to bring his accounts up to date with servants who had borrowed money from him. And in the process, one of his debtors was brought into him who owed millions of dollars. He couldn't pay. So the master ordered that he be sold along with his wife and children and everything he owned to pay the debt. But the man fell down before the master and begged him, please be patient with me and I will pay it all. And then his master was filled with pity for him and released him and forgave his debt. But when the man left the king, he went to a fellow servant who owed him a few thousand dollars and he grabbed him by the throat and demanded instant payment. His fellow servant fell down before him and begged for a little more time, please be patient with me and I will pay it, he pleaded, but his creditor wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested and put in prison until the debt could be paid in full. And when some of the other servants saw this, they were very upset and they went to the king and told him of everything that happened. And the king called the man in that he'd forgiven. And he said, you evil servant, I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? And then the angry king sent the man to prison to be tortured until he paid his entire debt. And then listen to these words, church. That's what my heavenly Father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. Here's the thing, the Bible warns us, don't forget. 
your own forgiveness. Don't forget the debt you could never have paid. And it's not to say that there isn't some debt against you, but it's to be reminded that compared to what Jesus did for us, for me then to walk in unforgiveness, for me then to refuse, to concede, to give grace, to extend love, I stand on dangerous ground, amen? When I look back and I see all my sin, what Jesus did for me, I'm just reminded that whatever anybody else could ever owe me, it pales in comparison with what Jesus has already done. So this is what I wanna do, my time is gone. I just wanna take a moment to make this practical or to make this personal for each of us and to reflect. For Pastor Kristen comes to close the service, I'd like to ask everybody to be in prayer. Just for a moment, would you bow your heads? Would you close your eyes and would you think about what we spoke of this morning? Holy Spirit, would you speak to each heart here today? Remind us to keep short accounts. Is there some place in our heart where a list is building, a pile is growing? Show us those things, Lord, that we would act against them in Your Name. Lord, show us anywhere that we need to talk to someone, not about them. We need to have the conversation and believe that there could be reconciliation, take the risk. Lord, show us any place where we've forgotten the Imago Dei, the image of God in someone around us. Remind us this morning, Holy Spirit, that we're connected. Show us the places where we're breaking or tearing at the very body of Christ. Remind us, Lord, any place where we've got a log in our eye. But most of all, Father, remind us of our own Redemption for every one of us in this room today that has accepted the saving work of Jesus, called on Him as Lord and Saviour and King, had our past wiped away, our sins are gone. And now when you look on us, you see not our sin, you see the blood of Jesus, who knew not sin, Lord, help us to walk in a revelation of that grace. In Jesus' beautiful Name I pray, Amen.